Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Leveraging Data Management Technologies, sponsored by Trifacta. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that features. And for questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email with, to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to, of the recording to this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And if you'd like to continue the conversation and networking after the webinar, you may go to community .net. Now let me turn it over to David for a brief word from our sponsor for today, Trifacta. David, hello and welcome. Oh, might have been there muted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> we can. All right. Thanks, Shannon. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David McNamara. I am a product marketing manager at Trifacta. We're excited to be a part of the data education webinar series as we feel the alignment of people, process, and technology, as Peter will discuss, is critical for organization success in the modern data context. Um, so at Trifacta, we have seen an evolution in the following areas of data management and analytics. There's been a shift from IT-led uh, data transformation to a more collaborative and coexistent approach with business teams and IT. Um, we've seen a shift in the way that uh, people use data, spin from transactional data to data that measures interactions and behaviors. We've seen a shift from on-premise deployments to hybrid and multi-cloud deployments. And we've seen a shift in the process from top-down approaches to processes that are more iterative and collaborative. Um, so, uh, there is this 80% problem that's fairly well understood. Uh, here's a quote from DJ Patel, former chief data scientist of the United States saying, it's impossible to overstress this. 80% of the work in any data project is in cleaning the data. Um, so this process involves accessing your data, discovering your data, discovering the contents of the data, uh, structuring that data, cleaning that data, blending it with other data sets, validating your results, and then eventually pushing that data into your downstream use cases, whether that's for reporting and analytics, uh, data science and machine learning, um, onboarding that data into an analytics platform, whatever your downstream use is. Um, so the reason that this process is so time consuming is that the technology that is being used by most organizations is not exactly fit for this purpose. Either IT teams own the data preparation using ETL tools, which creates somewhat of a bottleneck between IT and business teams. Business teams will send their requirements. IT will return with a spec of that data. That process will go back and forth and it will take a lot of time. And each time that business context changes or new analytics need to be derived, uh, that starts a whole new process that takes a lot of time. Um, other times, businesses use tools like Excel to do data preparation. We all know that doesn't really scale. It's fairly error prone and it doesn't have great lineage. It's not exactly the purpose for spreadsheets. Um, or maybe they use code, um, but again, there are drawbacks there. Code is very technical. A lot of analysts aren't quite proficient in it, not to mention it can be frustrating when you build a data preparation script, you see the results, you realize you need to go back, debug your code, start sort of from scratch. And if you have to transfer that script over to another person, it's hard for them to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, so Trifacta fills in this gap by providing the best of both worlds. Trifacta combines visual and machine learning guidance, uh, making it easier for non-technical users to discover the contents of your data, to clean that data, to structure and blend that data. Um, and all of this uh, process that you're doing in Trifacta is stored in a recipe that can be compiled and run on infrastructure in the cloud to run on data at any scale. And these recipes can be orchestrated through data pipelines to get continuous value from your analytics 
uh, projects. So you're sort of getting that visual and ease of use that you might be familiar with in tools like Excel, but you're also getting the um, automation capabilities of code and ETL. Uh, don't just take our word for it. Try to some of the largest organizations in the world using our technology, as well as startups looking to get a competitive advantage. And in keeping with the spirit of education, we have a new uh, series out called The Data School with Joe Hellerstein. Joe is a computer science professor at UC Berkeley. You can check out this series on our blog or YouTube channel. It's an ongoing educational resource for professionals who work with data, people who work with data systems, and managers who define data strategies. And if you'd like to learn more about Trifacta, please visit our website at trifacta.com. And with that, uh, Shannon, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, David, so much. And if you have questions for David about Trifecta, he will be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation with Peter. And now let me introduce to you our series speaker, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and he 11 books. The most recent is Your Data Strategy. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and is consist consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Peter, hello and welcome, and we're not quite seeing your screen yet. There we go. And you're muted as well. There we go, got me now? Thank you so yep. much. You're All right. Well, uh, <laughs> hi everybody, uh, let me give a special shout out to my mom on her 85th birthday today, and uh, let's dive in here and talk about data management technologies. So really key to understanding this is that data management is one part, sorry, data management technologies is one part of a three-legged stool, and David referred to it earlier uh, as well uh, on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some technology considerations. Uh, we'll talk about data technology architecture, case tool, repositories, profiling discovery tools, quality engineering tools, life cycle, and other types of technologies, just to give you a very, very dense one-hour session here on what these are. So let's let's dive in a little bit closer and, and take a look at some technology considerations, first of all. And, and the most important thing to keep in mind is that even people who've been in data for a while tend to know only one part of data. Again, like the blind person's in the elephant, somebody who's feeling the ear says the elephant is very much like a fan, and somebody who's feeling the trunk says it's very much like a snake, and somebody who's got the, the, the leg says it's like a tree, and somebody with the tail says it's a rope, and of course, if you're up against the side of it, it's like a wall, and all of them are correct from their perspective, but when we talk about data management, it's kind of a, an amorphous subject. So we talk about data management is everything that happens between the sources and the uses of data. Now, let's get to a, a more refined piece of this, which might be that we want to add the word reuse in here. If we're always processing only new data, um, then there's never, we're saying consciously, there's never any value of reusing data. Of course, we know that's incorrect and that we have lots and lots of value uh, reusing data. So here's a perhaps a better way to think about data. And, and really, I think it explains a bunch of problems that we have, challenges in the discipline. Um, if we think about sources, there's also a, a particular set of things, we can organize them according to collection, evaluation, preparation, evolution, access, and storage. And we call that generally data engineering on the left-hand side. There. There's not even widespread agreement about that, but that's where it comes in. We've got to make sure the data is stored, and then we exploit the data on the other side of it, where we have things like data science, data delivery, presentation, data storytelling, all out there. Again, these are aspects of data management, just like the elephant in there. But it, the real key is that that's for data use. If we want to talk about reuse, we've got to build a lot more into our program. So everything I'm showing you there in Teal generally does not exist for the most part in most data management programs. And our question from a technology perspective is how can we look at this and see that 
there's certain ways technology can be helpful and certain ways where technology can't be helpful. And that's what we'll try to cover in this hour here. Also, of course, it's governance. And governance, again, has got to extend the entire way through the data lifecycle on here, which means governance should apply to tool selection as well uh, on this. Let's think about how it works. Um, I, I use this analogy of making a better data sandwich. And I, I got this uh, analogy from a, a tea farm in India. I'll show you at the end here where it comes from. But right now we know that data literacy is of uneven quality. It turns out the US government has been tracking literacy around these issues uh, in here. And, and we're you know, holding our own, but that's not good in the face of an increasing uh, bunch of data. Uh, the data supply is, of course, of uneven quality, and the data standards, the ability to use within there is also uneven, so it doesn't work as well as it could together. Um, our job as data professionals is to smooth out these processes and then engineer ways that they will start to work together. And this simply cannot happen without engineering and architecture understanding. So this concept of the domain-specific knowledge is real important for evaluating tools. I mentioned this came from uh, a, um, excuse me, a visit I had made to India a couple of years back where um, this tea farm that I'm showing you the picture of had at the cash register quality data engineering and architecture work products do not happen accidentally. And they're uh, so, so absolutely true on that. Uh, just think about it. This is a, a bit and anything that doesn't work is sand grinding the gears of your organization. So, Technologies by themselves are just a one-legged stool. Uh, when and if we go back to flying again, sitting on a one-legged stool on an airline ride is not even considered remotely safe. You need at least three legs uh, to understand this. And the three legs really do talk about specifically people, process, and technology legs. And while they're legs, they're also interdependent. And it's really key to make sure that we understand that only by working together in the right combinations will these things work. Interestingly enough, however, most recent um, poll done by our colleagues uh, at New Vintage Partners, uh, Randy Bean and Tom Davenport, came back with a finding that said that the technology part of data is only 10% of people's frustration, that 90% of the parts are people and process parts. So once again, keep that in mind as you look at this process of applying technology to your problem realizing that it's not going to solve most of your problems. There are things that, that none of these tools and technologies can do, but there's some things that they do very well. Let's start talking about it. First of all, MDM. Almost everybody thinks that you buy an MDM system. It's not. Uh, first of all, if you're not in our discipline, people think you're talking about mobile device management uh, because we're a much smaller discipline than the mobile device management market. Uh, so they win by sheer size, that's okay. But what we're really trying to do is to say, this is really a strategy, not as a silver bullet uh, on here. And yet it's sold that way and people buy it and consume it, and it becomes very much problematic. Now the idea of mass data is that we simply have a set of constructs wherein when we change the system of record, I was just working with my students a, a few minutes ago, and if we said if we changed your address record, we wouldn't want to change that in every record of every class that you took. That would be inefficient. Um, we might need to know where your residence was when you took a class, but there still are better data structures than that. And, and this whole MDM architecture really does, it's, it's being sold as, as much more of a technology solution than strategy. And then, so that's the first bit of this, is to apply to this in the idea that this MDM is not going to be a solution out of the box for you, but it's a strategy for people to adopt. And the key is, if we de-emphasize the people in the process components, then we're not going to have the proper governance and process architecture components in our architecture, and that will make it less likely the tool will succeed. Again, the data will be good, but we've also got to have the tools and methods in here. And there's a very big disparity right at the moment between tools and methods. Uh, right now, stored data is increasing at almost 30% annually, and the data workforce is not growing much at all. And so what that really means is that band is here and the supply is here. Um, now, unfortunately, my undergraduate classes are facing a situation where they have all of a sudden, at the beginning of the semester, they had one of the best employment outcomes they were looking at possibly uh, ever in the history, and all of a sudden there are 15 million people uh, between them and the, and the jobs that they want. So we want to be careful of this, and we've been emphasizing that it's really key 
to not paint yourself into a corner because a fool with a tool is still the fool. And let's take a look at what that means. We can look and predict, this is something called Moore's Law, about where technology is going to be at a certain day because we understand the progress, the pace of progress that it's making. Uh, the hardest part of doing requirements is not doing the design portion of it. And what we're trying to do is to tell people that you need to postpone these technology investments as long as you can because however long you imagine you can postpone them, there is going to be a cheaper version of it coming along in the near future. The other thing to be careful of too is that some vendors are very unfortunate uh, in the way they describe what's going on with their tools. Um, I had the, the uh, CEO of a very large utility company lecturing to my students a couple weeks ago, and he said, you know what my biggest problem is? When I tell the vendors I don't need their technology, they go around me and talk to my board of directors and talk to my, uh, my boss. Uh, it's, it's really hard to explain to them multiple times around this. Um, there's a couple companies that, that do what's called vendor project promise auditing, which is the idea that if something is promised, you ought to follow up and make sure it's actually delivered. What a, what a novel concept. Uh, so in that piece there, that there's just very low understanding outside of IT of something called the hype cycle or the hype curve. Now, Gartner likes to claim credit for it, but truly um, it was actually invented by um, uh, uh, Lady Augusta Ada King, who is also known as Ada Lovelace. Uh, Ada was the daughter of Lord Byron and a brilliant, brilliant person in and of herself. She looked at weaving machines that actually have like computer card interfaces and said, I could do math on that. And people said, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, at some point, somebody will invent a machine called a computer and it will be able to compute these things. So this is a picture of the actual Bernoulli computations that she was planning to put into the computers just as soon as they were invented. Now, she also gave a talk here, and, and I put it on the first slide, but I went past it pretty quick. It was really easy. It says, when considering any new subject, there's frequently a tendency to first overstate what we find to be interesting or remarkable, and then secondly, by a natural reaction, undervalue the true state of the case. Notice that is pure psychology, and Gartner encompassed it in their life cycle, excuse me, the hype cycle, that says a technology trigger leads a brand new technology to something they call the peak of inflated expectations. And then the next thing that happens, the next phase almost inevitably is something called the trial of disillusionment, only by going up the slope of enlightenment and reaching the plow of product excuse me, plateau of productivity, do we really actually understand how to gain the benefit from this tool? Let me show you how that is used in, in real time. Here's July 1918, not particularly relevant, but if you were, data as a service was at the top of that life cycle, probably not the best thing to invest in at the time. Uh, information stewardship applications were, were really headed for the trial, uh, not great. And if you're doing master data management in the July of 1918, excuse me, 2018, 1918, that would be fun. Um, things were looking pretty good. They've, they've gotten through their stuff and they're trying to get back to where they ought to be. Again, just a couple more. Database platform as a service was maturing. That seemed to be very, very nice. Here's another one for information governance and master data. Again, if you're doing machine learning in July of 2018, that's great. If you're doing metadata management solutions, not so good. Uh, and again, the MDM stuff was on the upswing that you were looking at. One, one more real quick one, uh, and analytics and artificial intelligence, same thing. Data storytelling was on the upswing. Uh, prescriptive analytics, right at the top, not the best place to be in that year. You can get these. If you have trouble getting them yourself, uh, it's pretty straightforward to call up a colleague in the library uh, at your local university that does have access to most of the Gardner stuff, and they can get access to it for I'm not saying steal, um, but uh, certainly uh, doing collaborative research with the university is a really good thing. Okay, so with that as background, let's look specifically at some data management technologies. Again, they should follow the same concepts around here as managing data. So the idea is we want to make sure that what we're doing is managing data as data. Now, ITEL has a wonderful library to do this, but they don't really have a lot of data parts in the ITEL uh, library. They also understood some parts of the elephant, but not all of it. Um, key there is, again, that requirements and design dichotomy we talked to before. The hardest part of doing requirements is not, in fact, jumping into your design aspects of it. So it tells you what the context is in the value for it. And the data technology solution to be what, what problem are you trying to solve with this data technology? 
what sets this technology apart from any others? Uh, where are there specific challenges around this? Uh, for example, I have a 10 page document down to the mouse click level for my students to get access to a secure server with their case tool platform that they're working on at this semester. Uh, and finally, is that a security uh, breach that you need to look for? So all of these are critical questions to consider as you're diving into this. The data technology is part of the overall technology. It's often considered as part of the specific architecture enterprise, and it addresses what technologies are standard, required, preferred, acceptable, and these are going to be different answers for different organizations. If you're part of a larger organization, they probably have specified. Um, if they haven't, it's probably a good idea for them to specify because the simplicity will benefit the larger organization. What technologies apply to which purposes and circumstances? Uh, again, just because you have a technology doesn't mean you should do it. The aphorism around this is we've taught students how to use a hammer, so they look around for every problem to look exactly like a nail so they can use the tools that we've taught them with. It's backwards. And in a distributed environment, how is the data movement handled? Very critical, important part of the problem. So let's dive into this first one, which is the case tools. Case is a subject which unfortunately is not taught barely in schools uh, at the analysis and design level. It is, I'm not sure what or how, but it has disappeared from the curriculum. Um, so we tell the students that there's lots of metadata that they need to manage and that somehow they should do it by paper. And some of them will run into case tools and ask us about it and we'll say, yes, they, they do exist, but it's not part of the textbook. So uh, they don't even learn of its existence. Oh my goodness, what a crime. Case tools have been around for years, decades, generations, long time. The idea mm -hmm. is if we have information about the aspects of the system development, in this case, a vision for the system, then we can add everything from planning statements to entities, to attributes, to models, to very specific pieces here. And if you haven't seen case tools, um, I would suggest uh, by all means just Googling them and getting started on it. They have come a long way. Um, we went through a period in time where the market was not looking very healthy for them. Uh, it's a true, true story here. I was with a bank president at one point, and they were trying to decide on a, a metadata management tool. And I said to them that the recent acquisition they had just done of a company, which was a you know, fairly major acquisition, that this entire industry fit into that acquisition, and they could simply added it on as a part of that acquisition. They would not only have all of the technology that was available, but most importantly, they would have kept it the ability to keep it from their competition. Um, they really like that particular idea. All of these can be done at strategic, tactical, operational levels. You can look at the entire model or select the pieces of it. And, and again, the case tools are designed to help you do this. One more picture on, on case tools, which is that they've also gotten into XML and, and looking at things from multiple perspectives. So again, you might be looking at a, um, a component of a DFD that has certain elements and attributes in it that you want to be sure that you're highlighting around the, the, the bit. The, the goal is that the case tool should provide you the most golden source, just the same way as master data management provides you with the best source of this information around all this. The, the challenge with case tools, and this is an older example uh, on all this that I'll lead into, uh, you know, Microsoft has their own tools that help out. And in fact, the, the most popular case tool is Microsoft Excel. Second one is PowerPoint. I know that's really a bad uh, state of, of affairs, but it's nevertheless true. Uh, what it means is that if you're using anything above Excel, PowerPoint, and Visio, you're actually jumping into newer technologies. Again, both of these have come up. Rational Rose used to be the main thing. There's a lot of open source tools, but just because it's open source doesn't mean it's free uh, in order to do this. And there's a wonderful set of lists of case tools that you can go look through on top of all sorts of uh, pluses and minuses about each of the various case tools. The, the gotcha part of case tools is this. Uh, we start at the top part and say, let's, again, whether these numbers are realistic or not, they were realistic at one point in time. You're going to pay X per, let's say it's $2,500 a seat, and I've got 75 developers that I want to have. Um, you know, that multiplies into a tip of the iceberg situation where you need to add another million dollars in training to the whole thing, and then in stock support, other things that go along with the, the process. So it's a multi, 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 multiple consensus. Boy, I can't say that word. Hang on. We drink a soda. That'll fix my problem. Multiplicative. No, I still can't get it. Anyway, mul multiplicative. Multiplicative. There we go. Multiplicative effect. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you guys go through that. Uh, 
the goal of case tools, of course, is you need to have them not on a displayed basis like this, which is a lot of overhead, but to try and find an entry point where you think it will provide a value and then support it as long as it provides value. Most of these organizations are now into renting their technologies, and that's actually quite a big help because you can turn them on and off as you need to, although a different subject topic here, but I say over and over again that your data management program should be as durable as your HR program. Nobody ever does say, by the way, we're done with HR, so let's, let's we've hired our last person. Let's close HR up. We don't need them anymore. And, and you've got to get people to understand that data is exactly the same thing in here. It's a programmatic effort. So I'm going to sort of hit you with two final slides on case tools. The first one is a quotes taxonomy here. Just to know that just like every different type of uh, good mature technology, there are different strata, different layers, different levels of where it should be. So it is well worthwhile to investigate and see if case tools have the requisite knowledge skills um, for you to do. Obviously, case tools don't have knowledge and skills, but you know, they can do the things, capabilities, what we're looking for there uh, for this, and, and try to figure out where it fits in the general scheme of things, because it's a fairly big environment. Trends that are working in the model and the marketplace are that the old way, if you will, the legacy way is that everything must fit into one specific technology. Uh, with the addition of XML and um, special portals and type things, we've now been able to sort of morph that into a good set of integration where we can use case tools as more of utilities to go in and do certain things. For example, some case tools are really good at normalizing data. It's a mathematical process. It's not 100% perfect, but I'd sure rather use it than not use it. Um, and it also walks you through a very nice um, step process to, to squeeze some uh, anomalies out of the process. So that's a, a great way of using a case tool as a utility rather than having to necessarily build and invest in it all the way around. All right, well, that's basically it on case tools. Let's move on now to repositories. And repositories are also a very big challenge in organizations. Uh, Gartner data again here looks and says, what are the challenges for data management practices in here? Well, the real key is that 60% of them identify delivering value. Trying to find data that delivers certain value for you and scoping these is the major thing. And also then supporting data governance and data security. And you can see the rest of them uh, wander off down the end. And yet when we look at what's happening on the metadata spend, metadata is really only representing 12% of the time. This is a time and motion study spent in data management, but it's a probably pretty good reaction to it. So repositories, to get a 12% lift, most people are not really interested in that. Even though this was written 30 years, 20 years ago, uh, it's still true. Most executive and IS managers view a repository as an esoteric technology that's not related directly to the business. Well, I, when they're asked that, I refer them to the old Wells Fargo model that I was familiar with back from a couple of years back that was so directly connected and so well-managed, so state-of-the-art uh, managed to their production system that if the metadata system went down, production went down, and if production went down, metadata went down, that's a, a tremendous achievement with that. I don't know, I'm not affiliated with Wells Fargo, so I don't know if they've kept that up, but it was a spectacular world-class achievement at one point in time. And uh, it was, uh, I got to witness it firsthand, it was just terrific. So what's happening when people use repositories? Well, most of them aren't, just for starters, and many are building their own, which is a really good idea. Keeping metadata, I've already said, is the same as keeping data. So building your own environment for a metadata repository is a really excellent way of learning about what you're trying to get into if you haven't had the ability to do this. Now, let me tell another story. I won't tell you which uh, organization this was, but it is one that I have some of my retirement savings with, uh, so I hope they do well. But I know that they have a repository that they purchased so that they can answer a question on a survey, yes, we have purchased a repository, but I also happen to know that they haven't taken the shrink wrap off of their uh, repository because the company that wanted to get them to take the shrink wrap off and actually use the repository that they had purchased didn't. Gosh, what a terrible story. Now, let's go back to that 23%. All of you out there have a SQL Server guru that you can get. If you don't have one that's local to you, you can certainly go to the local university and find an A student that's doing really well that needs an extra project. Um, and build yourself a little repository. I've been doing this with companies for well over 30 years. 
the idea is that you build it and you use it yourself and you get smarter about the process. And then you'll be able to have a really good conversation with the repository vendors in there. The major categories are really kind of small players around this whole idea. And I don't mean tiny, but there, there's a lot of choices. So again, July uh, 2018, Gartner puts out these types of challenges here that show the magic quadrants. And if you're up in those magic quadrants, then that tends to give you good points as far as being able to match capabilities. Again, I would suggest for all of you that you don't, that you build your own and play with it for a couple of years. Um, it's the idea of, of saying, you know, we'd like to have a pet. Okay, that's great, but you also have to take the pet to the, to the vets and feed it and take it outside and give it runs and all the rest of the things. It's not just the cuteness that comes into it. And, and that's an important set of characteristics for these because again, remember, 90% of these problems are not going to be technology problems. They're going to be getting people to adopt the change ways in which they work. Uh, a, a quick show you deviation, how, how unfortunately we got kind of really far out on this, which was the idea that um, IBM published some text a while back. If you Google IBM's AD cycle information model, they put together the metadata model to rule all mothers. Uh, it's a metadata model of metadata models that shows how all these are related. And most importantly, it's wonderfully developed metadata uh, material that you can use in your uh, projects as a starting point. You do not need to start off from scratch. In fact, that'll be one of the major topics when we get into some of the data design issues, that there's lots and lots of templates and patterns that you can use, including here, that are super useful. Also, my colleague Mike Gorman has a little simplified worker version of this as well that is extremely useful. Just a little quick plug for him because it's so useful. So the key here is that repositories don't have to be integrated solutions, but it must be an easily integratable solution. That means it's acceptable to use spreadsheets as long as you all use spreadsheets that can be integrated at some point in the future. Having repository functionality does not equal a repository. It must easily evolve into it, but it doesn't have to start out that way. This is the pathway that you can take to gradually grow towards that. Again, multiple spreadsheets, multiple repositories are not necessarily bad. And minimum functionality ideas are the way to get into these things. So wonderful ways of checking all of this, diving into it a little bit further and learning about it before you go directly from not having one to paying lots of money and trying to install it as a major business initiative. First law of data management, in order to manage metadata, you need this for fun repository functionality. If you don't have it, your whole project's doomed. All right, so let's move into a class of tools called profiling and discovery tools. <laughs> Have a little soda here again. The idea here, I showed the, the results of this before, is how much time is spent by data management teams across all of their disciplines. You can see that we quoted the 12% functionality there on that. Another part of it, though, over here on the left hand side is looking at governance, quality, and integration. And I consider these three activities to be complementary to the things on the right-hand side of the diagram, but it gets to the 80% that, that David was describing in his intro as well. That 80% of the time, DJ Patel said, is spent, there's a word for it, it's called munging the data. I don't even use the word in the presentations, but it's doing all the things that you need to do to get ready for it. And this does, this history of uh, technologies does have a, a interesting basis for this. This was money that we funded out of the Defense Department to Carnegie Mellon University, and we asked for questions on how they could come up with ways of describing these things. Um, and, and they sent the money to a woman named Dina Bitten, uh, who I'm hoping to get for one of these webinars that we can uh, put together, because she was instrumental in creating the algorithms that formed the basis of this profiling discovery analysis techniques and technologies that we have. The key for these things is that they can deliver up to 10 times productivity over manual approaches. And that's important because the lessons here clearly are that people's time is much more expensive than the standard uh, machine time that we can put on these things. And we've changed the model of how we used to construct and answer questions about data. The old model used to look like this. We would do old stuff. It would be manual in nature. 
it would be brute force independent. And it would not really address quality aspects at that point, and it would only be done once. And we do it by throwing a projector down on the table and spinning up these models and showing these models as able to um, represent the business concepts that we had. Now, the new way with these profiling tools is semi-automated, engineered, repository independent. We can integrate quality. They are repeatable. They give you currency and accuracy that goes into these. Let me show you the sample type of results that come from profiling technologies. For example, the old way of looking at something might be to examine a bunch of data. The new way of doing it, we can now look at this pile of data and see that I've circled a little bit above row five. It's actually column five, right? We have a pay code value of minimum asterisk, a minimum value of an asterisk and a maximum value next to it of V, Victor. Okay, interesting. You're sort of going, what is that? I don't know. And normally we would have to go find a, an SME, sometimes even get permission to access the SME. Um, I've had some companies where I've worked for where they send minders with me to make sure that when I access the SME, I don't upset IT plans. Uh, it's an interesting concept here. So we're looking at this pay code asterisk and trying to figure out what it is. But one of the things we can do with profiling tools is that we can double click on that column five and it will show me the values, the frequencies. And again, the value there right under that circle is the asterisk it shows up 11.5% of the time, 587 specific instances in the sample data that I'm looking at, but enough to tell us that 11.5 distribution, ooh, maybe somebody remembers that not only did we put those numbers that were up there, but we can also double click again on those with the asterisk. And sure enough, they pop up and they've all got payment method UK. So what became originally the process of I'm not sure what this is, and I'm going to have to go find somebody and ask it. And we say pay code and asterisk. What tables are you looking at? When were you looking at them? I mean, there's lots of questions that go on to all of these. And they show up in this type of a weekly project schedule. When we would do this, I actually had the title once, U.S. Department of Defense Reverse Engineering Program Manager. Yes, when we did this, we would take three days a week and prepare in the mornings, and we would require the participation of the expensive subject matter experts. By the way, the way you discover your subject matter experts in a technology exercise is you ask the question, who in this organization is so valuable that you could not do without them? You get them to write those 10 names on the paper and then you turn the paper around and say, those are the only people that are acceptable for my team because they're clearly the ones that can get us through this process efficiently and effectively. And as you might imagine, if you do win that battle, they are expensive people. Here's the proactive approach looking at Again, using these technologies, the proactive approach allows organizations now to spend most of the time not participating with the development. That gives the people that are the data analysts time off to look at the model preparation pieces. It's all getting ready for it. And we only need the, the subject matter experts a couple of times during perhaps a couple of afternoon sessions. It's clearly an order of magnitude cheaper for them to occur. Um, interestingly enough, before they sponsored, I have called out Trifacta as a really wonderful set of technologies that do this. It's not officially a profiling tool. I'm sure David can clarify that when we get back to the questions and answers uh, in 20 minutes that we're heading up towards. But I've used Trifacta for years and years, and I even use, they've got a great commercial up there that shows, they call it data wrangling. It's still that same 80% uh, that's out there. So you've got a bunch of tools that are in here that fall into these categories that are really, really useful. There's the visualization that Trifecta uses on their site. You know that data is valuable. By the way, the website is trifecta.com, so get it. Uh, a lot of data is all over the place, but too much of it can be messy. I'm going to add some other narrative on here too, which is that 80% of data is redundant or, excuse me, 80% of your data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And again, these tools help you to get rid of certain aspects of what's going on there as well. So again, just a video quick, but you guys can get to that one and take a look at it. Let's move on and talk about four categories of data quality engineering tools. The categories are basically thinking about it, cleaning it, making it better, and just simply checking on it. All right? Again, they divide up into not easy categories. The categories are going to go back to profiling because, yes, while you're looking at that 11% of the data that has an asterisk as the lowest value in that column, you can also create a query that goes back and make sure that all the rest of your legacy data is similarly clean 
and pristine in that same way. You could talk about parsing and standardization, transformation, identity resolution, and mapping, enhancement, and reporting. So again, that's what's coming up on these next little bits. Again, remember, we used to do the profiling in an old way. So profiling now gives us a set of algorithms that allow us to do statistical analysis of the data quality values, as well as explore the relationships between these value collections. Some of these technologies are so good that you can derive a logical third normal form from any physical pile of data just by ingesting it into the tool and working with it. Again, it is a semi-automated process, not an automated process, but it's still much faster than trying to figure it out on your own. So these data quality tools also fall into parsing and standardization. And the question here is, let's look through a bunch of numbers that have kind of groups. 301, 745, 6350. What are we looking for? Well, gosh, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a rule that says we're always going to be looking for telephone numbers in here. And you can see there are some examples where it follows and some where it doesn't exactly conform. The parsing tool notices the problem, the standardization capabilities corrects and addresses the problem. Most of the um, profiling tools do the identification piece. They do not necessarily use the standardization piece. So that's a disconnect there. Some of them are more integrated uh, between the two. But we, you can see as we're looking at these um, codes that we go through and saying, what do we use these codes for? How are they supposed to work together and apart? And all of this information will help you get towards something that you're trying to do, which should be driven by a specific articulatable business objective. I gave this lecture to the undergrads the other day because they didn't know what a area code was. Uh, those of you that are young looking at this, that's the 301 part. And we used to have a rule in the United States of America that if a group of numbers were associated with a telephone and it had a zero as the middle of the three numbers, it was automatically and always an area code, and then we ran out of area codes. So we don't have those abilities to do that anymore, but we can at least go back in and look at these parsing types of tools. We look at pattern types of tools. Again, these can take a look and say, ah, there's data, we clean it up, and then maybe we want to group it. So we're going to try to categorize it according to one or more patterns. These numbers are numbers that could be telephone numbers because they match numbers that show up on a um, list of validated telephone numbers. Uh, so again, we can go one step beyond this and try to find things that fall into patterns. Interestingly, the development of technology in this area of the business is such that the algorithms are far more developed than the actual practices. And the reason is because somebody Smart people do this, right? We'll go through and learn a technique for grouping things appropriately. And what they'll do is they'll develop an algorithm that needs to be trained. So the algorithm will be sound, but the algorithm will not be operationalizable until you have trained the algorithm. The training of the algorithm requires good data. And that's the biggest bottleneck that we have right now in artificial intelligence is we have a dearth of good data sets for people and algorithms to be trained on. One final example before I move on to the next category, and that is that if you're doing training of uh, visual systems, such as uh, uh, um, you know space scanning and things like this, the visual skate face scanning and, and technologies in there are are able to do certain things, but are not able to come back and actually give people the kinds of results that they want. And so you can. You're seeing cities now that are saying, while you may do that, we're not going to let you use them here. Um, so again, this lack of data to understand this pattern recognition stuff is something that's really hurting and someplace for somebody to make a very good contribution to the industry. Again, our fourth category of, of these are identity resolution and matching. One of the more insidious problems, I was speaking to a, the CDO of one of the states right now who was working obviously on coronavirus uh, types of issues. And he says, one of the biggest problems that we're having, um, and let, let me just back up on this because this is a really interesting uh, example. One of the biggest problems that we're having is making coronavirus personal to people because if you don't make it personal to people, they don't understand the implications and won't pay enough attention to realize that it's a threat. 
So his data was coming into him based on um, healthcare facilities, but the data that he needed to have was based on patient zip codes. Now you can imagine that's a big challenge and it's a perfect type of problem to apply these data quality tools for it. Uh, again, you can look at a number of distinct techniques that are deterministic relying on defined patterns, or you can make rules that are predictable or even probabilistic, uh, or just based on the experience of matchers and designers. As I mentioned before, most of these create products that are then turned into trainable algorithms that, that then themselves become useful in and amongst all of this. Remember, we're just on data quality tools here, and we're kind of flipping through them fast. Another set of data quality tools fifth types are what we call enhancement tools. And this is the idea that things are coming along and we're adding value to them. One of the most important valuable things that we can provide to data is its provenance, terrible word, or its lineage. Where did it come from? From where did you get these uh, person data? But you can see I've got other examples up. Date and timestamps, auditing information, contextual stuff. Where we failed as a society is that when we look at data quality activities and we take resolution to, to resolve the data quality problems, on a regular basis, uh, we forget to record our lessons learned from that process. Last type of data quality tools, reporting tools. And these tools are mostly what people think of as BI and all the rest of the things that go through, but they can also be used quite a bit in Cool. So what you want to do is set up dashboards and things that show you, or more importantly, alert somebody when we get certain things that are not within tolerance. We can catch them early on here. We do not have to go back out and put them in the field and then call them back and say, oh, gosh, all the work that you guys did yesterday, you need to do it over again because we screwed it up. Again, very brief overview of all of those bits and pieces. Now let's dive a little bit more into some life cycle considerations, just to show you what a specific challenge it is. Uh, our good friend Tom Redman uh, put out this original version of the life cycle in 93 with his understanding of the time of what was going on. And I think that was a, a reasonably correct place. Uh, you need to acquire data, you're going to store data, and you're going to use it. Uh, it turns out it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So we've gotten better as an industry. We now understand that Storing data requires us to do some steps before, which is to create some metadata, structure the metadata, then we can create the data. Uh, each of these more complex lifecycle considerations also then leads to a mapping back and forth between these portions of the lifecycle and the types of tools that you're doing. So there's a good mapping that occurs here. Let me go back in a second, though. I'm going to talk a little bit more on this slide. So again, the original version was acquire, store, and use. Good stuff, makes perfectly good sense, but our understanding is a little better now. We can't just store somebody's data unless we create some metadata first, a place to hold it. And we structure that data, we move it around, move it, organize it. Those data structures can also become intellectual property all the way up and down. It's very, very important uh, types of information. Again, if we in, at least in the state I was talking to, they had collected their data correctly, they may have been able to get information to people and save lives, right? So it's, it does work. Only once you've done those first two activities do you actually create the data. Data is then stored as it was in the original part. It is utilized, and utilization may involve manipulation, so it may go back in and be restored. The utilization may also involve assessment, which was what we were describing a few tools back to reporting and um, uh, um, enhancement type of uh, data quality tools, we may want to refine them, and that data could also be restored. Then, out of that data assessment, we oftentimes will decide that we need to refine the metadata, that a different structure of metadata will better suit our needs. Those are re-engineering considerations. Sometimes they're critical and important. Uh, other times they're not. That's one of the things that you guys are more expert at in your specific domains that are there. So when thinking about the life cycle, understand it's a lot more complicated than just use, storage, and create just the same way as data management is more complex than anything between when data is captured and when data is used. We've got to get more precise about that or it's simply not helpful. Let's talk about another set of these technologies here as well. Whoops, I'm sorry I went too fast and that was really rude. The focus around data integration, we added new um, pie wedge to the um, Bimbok 
this time talking about data integration. And there's some specific tools that allow to be combinations of the things we've talked about before that will actually come into um, additional types of, of technologies that can be utilized in here. So one of them are portals. And portals, even though it's kind of an old subject, they never really were utilized to their full potential. Uh, what we basically would do is wrap up green screen applications and put them a portal on top of. Uh, again, all that's good, but you can take this a little bit further, and this is where we see most organizations not doing so. If your portal was fully XML enabled, then you can also enable data interchange at the portal level. Now, this is another important part of data quality that you can use data management technologies to do. One of the things I will, I will often advise my clients as I'm speaking with them um, on specific problems around this is that they'll say, well, I don't trust the data. Say, okay, well, let's figure out what it would take for you to trust the data. And let's put data only in a portal where it is of known capabilities, known levels of quality, known lineage. Again, you determine, it's your business, so you decide what's better on this. These portals can become extremely powerful in doing what I call data branding exercises, which is a great way of selling your data management program to the rest of your organization. Because what they'll come to other managers and say, I want my data in that portal, not realizing what that means is that it's been brought in, cleansed, understood, and architecturally integrated with the other data in the portal. Again, many of the states are doing this taking their original data dumps of, um, you know, sort of the first version of data.gov 101, which is a collection of PDF files in many cases, and, and putting truly integrated data out there so that we can enable the citizen data scientists that we'd like to. Not here, it's not gonna happen this week, but it may get there at some point. These web services can then be wrapped up depending on what's actually going on here. And I'll just tell a quick little story on this particular, this is a, get off the mainframe rehosting kind of thing. You know, all people think mainframes are too expensive because they haven't got their first cloud bill yet. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things that we did here was that the portal replaced the interface. So interface code is about a third of the code that you have in your legacy systems. And these could be moved into tiny bit web services that actually function much more efficiently and effectively, and most importantly, can be parallelized uh, in the process of doing this. So again, portal as a technology, some things that are very useful here, most people are not utilizing, they're kind of falling into the, the real advantage. One thing that I've not seen for a long time, and I, I was very familiar with these guys when they were around, um, they had created a XML portal for everything in SAP. And it looked like a terrific idea, and then they got bought by SAP, and I'm not sure what happened to it. Maybe somebody will tell us uh, whatever happened to the top tier product, because it looked like anything could be connectable to anything else potentially under this portal with it. Certainly is the way I used it in production. So it was a very interesting piece. But of course, what I used was never part of SAP. Sometimes software goes places to die. Sometimes it actually comes back with a new life. These portals can also be used as data quality tools where you can do the kinds of analysis on the specific tools that we're looking at. A couple more things in here, just more acronyms, unfortunately, ETL, most people are familiar with that. I've got a group here in Richmond that decided that data engineering is, is the primary focus of ESIC. It's a good definition, it's not correct. It leaves out some other things, but it's an excellent place to focus because of the leverage that you have. Another group are looking at enterprise application integration and enterprise information integration. So if these things catch on, they'll eventually become parts of the Gartner findings and things like that that'll come out there. Uh, for example, here's a, one from a couple of years ago where the um, orange tables are the base tables, but the uh, other tables that were, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot backwards, the teal tables are the base tables and the orange tables are the virtual tables. And, you know, Amazon can do these things now, so a lot of these technologies have migrated towards clouds. This is probably one thing that your mainframe will have more difficulty doing than not, although you should see the mainframe we're going to buy at VCU. It's going to be a doozy. So we've looked at a couple different things here. Again, three-legged stools taking care of 10% of our technology problems. So I've really left you with a big challenge of addressing these other people and process problems, but that's not what we created the survey for uh, around this. So let's take a, a, a couple steps back on all this and just sort of think through some key Gartner findings around cloud issues, interestingly enough, uh, around machine learning, uh, also things that are becoming more and more useful, useful out of there. 
one of the things Gartner is saying is that cloud is going to become a commodity within three years. And the only reason you use a Google cloud is because you're really interested in what's happening at YouTube. Or the only reason you use a Microsoft cloud is because you're really interested in Office 360 and or LinkedIn, good sources of data, by the way, both. And, and the only reason you use an Amazon cloud is because you're interested in retail. Um, we'll see whether Gartner is correct. That's one of the wonderful things about Gartner. They do this and they put a date and a probability on it. So when we take these things all together, what we're trying to do is get people to realize that data and data technologies really only represent the tip of the iceberg. And, and if we can get them to here, which is a desired state, that would be wonderful. But truly what they really need to realize is that this is more of the correct version of this. And we're getting all sorts of people that really want to get into going digital, right? You probably are under pressure from your own management, go digital. Of course, nobody knows what that means, but we do know something. It's not possible to go digital without at least spelling data, and you need to spell it correctly in order to get it to work for you. So this data process of trying to figure out where data fits into all of this is so foundational and so fundamental. I was so proud of my undergrads today because they really got it. This is my own personal logo that I use. Uh, any bad data into anything awesome is going to give you bad results. And yet I saw this recently out on LinkedIn. It was so recent. It was truly scary. Uh, you know, this guy says, oh, I just realized something. I've got something awesome. And you put bad things in, you're likely to get bad things out. By the way, I'm going to consider that chocolate ice cream. So uh, yummy uh, stuff in there. And it, his, his real interesting insight was it's true with blockchain. It's true without blockchain. And yes, the fact that that's a recent technology realization for you, I hope you're very young. Uh, that's the only thing I can say in there. So this gets us to now what we talk about garbage in and garbage out. And G-I-G-O means that garbage is going to be there. It's going to sit over top of everything else. And if you've got the perfect model, you're still going to get garbage results. If you've got a wonderful data warehouse, you're still going to have garbage results. If you've got great machine learning, business intelligence, blockchain, AI, MDM, data governance, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They are all going to be dependent on having that good data. And if we don't correct that good data, then we will never be able to get good information out of whatever technologies we are attempting to use as we go through this. So in order to get to this quality, keep working through all of these bits and pieces. I'm leaving you with a couple of specific uh, takeaways here that are just some lists of tools that you can take a look at from our Dimbox on here. And lastly, with a little bit of guidance from Gartner, which is to say that the process of buying should really be considered an investment process. And just like any investment, it's important to kick the tires. It's important to check references. Most of this stuff has been around for some good amount of time. Most of the vendors will be very happy to put you in touch with clients, and sometimes you'll need to sign a non-disclosure with them, but that can help you understand where you're going. The biggest problem that we have in the technology aspects of data management is that the vendor's products are up at level 10, and most organizational procurement processes are down at level 1. And it's not a very good conversation. And it leads to too much rework and change. And that's just very, very unfortunate. So take a look at the idea of looking at the capabilities, but also make sure what data they need to have. It wouldn't do any good to buy a great tool if you didn't have the right data to feed it. So it's an interdependent set of processes. Use that, level, that automation to free up scarce specialist resources. A book that has been wonderful for this, a very unexpected uh, aspect, is that my wife told me when I, I met her, she said, before we have any business conversations, you need to read a book called The Goal by L. Hugh Goldratt. And I said, what is it? And she said, that's all I'm going to say. If you don't read the book, we are not talking about it. Okay. And I went and read it. And this is a very good way of describing it. It's basically the theory of constraints and saying that in your organization, there are things that are keeping you from getting things done. Find those places. Look for those circles around a couple of key specific pieces where data automation technology can be helpful. Use it for that purpose. Make sure it's a, it has a good business case for that purpose, that it does re achieve positive return on investment. And then update your policies and governance around all of this. Again, if you're into machine learning and all this sort of thing, don't, stop paying people to develop algorithms that we can't feed with data. It doesn't make any sense. So we're back here at the top of the hour, and it's time for us to invite David back and to turn it back over to Shannon and see what sort of questions you guys have about this technology. 
Peter, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. If you have questions for Peter or David, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just as a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Um, and everybody's really quiet today. Let me scroll oh, up. I put them all <laughs> with my droning. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> They'll come back and listen later on. Oh, no, it's been good. There's been a lot of chat going on uh, amongst each other. Let me scroll through here. Let me just look through some. Um, uh, wow, well, lots of questions. Um, you get to pull them out. <laughs> lots of comments. Here we go. Um, so. Peter, how did you overcome the challenges to quote unquote sell the concepts? Uh, so let's let's go back to the premise on this. Um, the premise is that an investment in technology will produce positive returns on investment, and that you're doing it from the organization's perspective. Uh, again, I'll, I'll put David on the spot here because I know we want to drive him into the conversation, but I'm going to say that David's tool costs a dollar. Um, it does not. I'm making that up totally, and I hope I'm not blowing any of your sales uh, material here, David. But, you know, an investment of a technology that would save one of your knowledge workers maybe 100 hours is a very easy calculation to make. On the other hand, if you're not going to save the knowledge worker but 10 hours, maybe the dollar isn't right. Um, it's probably still a pretty good piece, by the way. I would buy it for a, a dollar, certainly. Uh, on that. David, you got any thoughts on that in terms of your determining your ROI when you do this kind of an investment? We haven't been studying it. We don't have a lot of good data out there the way we do uh, some of the other industries that are there. And that's a, a reflection that our discipline is probably less mature than we'd like it to be. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's sort of the hard metrics of how much time each person saves in their day-to-day -day job. There's also some soft measures of ROI that include things like discovering new elements of your data that you might not have seen in uh, using previous technologies. Um, and there's also sort of the added benefit of having extra time to explore new insights on your data, to find new analytics projects, to find new data science projects, whatever it might be. So there's sort of two elements of this. There's the time savings on one end, and there's also the uh, you know benefit of having this extra time and spending it on more creative outlets. Um, I suppose we could call this an opportunity benefit? Yeah, opportunity exactly. Cost. Yeah. Exactly. So given, given that type of a, a process there, again, I would not look to take your organization and completely automate everything that's going on. Uh, if you're running a data management group right now or, or you're a data leader of any sort, you know that things are probably happening or your paycheck wouldn't be coming to you. So. The question is, what makes an appropriate investment and what's a good way of introducing this technology in a, to an organization such that it gets adopted? Um, again, I'm reminded of a, a sort of funny thing that happened a couple of years back, which was that Mitt Romney had gone to a Wawa station, pushed some buttons on a, a computer, and his sandwich had popped out the other end after the people made it for him, and he was just amazed. He talked on and on about that until his handlers got him and said, Stop that, sir. That's been around for years and years, and it makes you look like you're out of touch. Um, most of the, the things that are working in your organization are good, but I guarantee you a good inspection will find some things that could be improved. And that's the first place to look to say, what can we do with this technology? Again, some of the technologies are multipurpose, and they can solve multiple different pieces of it. Others are relatively single purpose. So again, if you're going to use householding information um, in there, it's probably not going to be a real good way of determining whether your telephone numbers are all correct. Does that make sense? And we'll just rely on Shannon for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> so uh, diving in here, we got some great questions coming in in the Q&A section. Uh, so where is the data management data strategy right now in the hype cycle? And uh, do you have a use case with the hype of microservices architecture? I don't know the answer to either of those questions. I haven't looked for them, but they are definitely lookable, upable. David, do you have any information on that? Can you can you say that question one more time, Shannon? Sure, absolutely. So where is the data management data strategy right now in the hype cycle? And do you have a use case with the hype of microservices architecture? 
I'm not sure I have an answer to that one either. <laughs> Back to you, Peter. No problem. Uh, yeah, we don't know why these guys. There's probably something out there that we could look up, um, but I just don't know what, what that is. I would, would say that, you know, unfortunately, most of these things come and go through this exact process, that there's something useful in almost every new technology development. The one I'm very familiar with is service-oriented architectures. Um, think about it for a minute. If you had a tool that helped you identify services or a set of tools that would help you craft services in an environment, that would be terrific. But ask the question, I, I ran across one, it was a real interesting logistics company out in the Midwest, and they, um, they brought me into the project and, and I said, we're moving to SOA because uh, uh, our mainframe is too expensive. Uh, you know, I always disagree with the mainframe being too expensive uh, as a general premise, uh, just in general. Sometimes IBM will jack the prices up to get you off of old technology, but that's not the same thing as getting off the mainframe being too expensive. Anyway, the the idea was that they're looking at creating the service-oriented architecture to replace this. And so I, I looked at the major modules. There were six major modules in their architecture uh, that we had put together for them, and that they were finishing up um, the first third of the first architecture module, and they had spent 85% of their budget. So I'm hoping I painted the right picture there, right? They had, they had six modules to implement. They'd created one third of one of them and 85% of their programming budget had already been spent. Now I tell you that because I said, well, what did they build? And they said, oh, we've got more than 1400 services. I'm sorry, there's no program in the world that's gonna look through a list of 1400 services to find a specific one. You've gotta have them organized in a set of categories. And you know what? We already do that with GitHub and several other very good technologies. Why reinvent the wheel? Uh, around this again. So uh, just a comment on, on those types of fads. The microservices are a, a trend off of that, a very good trend, a lot of it incorporating, uh, again, very nice XML-based technologies that are just significantly good. Um, but I haven't seen the ability to weave them into a larger architecture to be of support for an enterprise yet. So for the data management techs, if the client is not well-versed on platforms, will hybrid, in-prem, or cloud be viable? <laughs> Anything's viable. Um, <laughs> the real question is, what are your business objectives? So uh, I'm pretty sure David will back me up on this as well when somebody goes in to look at buying his technology for a specific project. If you don't have a good idea what it is you're trying to accomplish, then it's very hard to say any technology will be better or worse in terms of supporting it. Um, your goal with uh, moving to the cloud might be to give more people access to it. Um, however, there are many types of access that can be passed around, whereas you can pass links and uh, move into some of the open data kind of uh, models and things like that. It would be much, much less expensive. David, maybe you could talk about the, the your, from your perspective, the importance of focusing on something specifically before you go and select the technology. Yeah, I mean, without knowing exactly what you're trying to accomplish with a change in technology, it's hard to properly evaluate it. So you can see some of the new technologies available and be blown away by what they can accomplish. But if you don't have an idea of how that can be implemented at your organization, it's not going to get you very far. Um, so, I mean, whenever we're doing uh, an evaluation with a prospect, we always first go into what's your use case? What are you trying to get out of it? What is the timeline? Do you have these specifics available ahead of time? Um, because really without those specifics, it's sort of a waste of, of everyone's time. And given that type of a context here, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um... I know that we used to be able to download a copy of Trifactor from your website, right? So somebody could actually try it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we we actually have a uh, browser-based free version now. So if you go to trifactor.com and click on the Start Free button, uh, you can create an account, use it using Chrome or Firefox, um, and upload your files and start wrangling pretty instantaneously. And that's the kind of exploration that you were describing earlier. Again, I, I want to just really emphasize this point. People have latched onto two things in data that as going to solve all our problems, silver bullets, uh, things that Clive taught me don't and never will exist. Uh, and there, that would be the silver bullets. So the, the technologies can in fact make things faster. Um, but what we have to do is we have to be 
facile with the technology so that we can actually make the appropriate use of the technology. Uh, I, I can remember coming in back in the day when it used to take us uh, literally a weekend. We would start a server up on uh, Friday night and hope it would be done by Monday morning. Uh, you know, is how long it used to take some of these these things. Now you can do them much more quickly in the cloud. Uh, but we we eventually, you know, said to this person, where have you been the last week? Oh, I just went ahead and analyzed all the tables. And we said, oh, no, we discovered that nine-tenths of them were redundant. Why are you doing the same profiling of each of the tables to prove something that we already know? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the focus there has got to be on that business problem. And if that business problem is not well articulated, then it's very hard to see whether the tool is successful or not. That's not what the tool vendors want, and certainly not what your business wants. So, uh, speaking as a, as an enterprise architect, and before I'm embarking on a data science project, the data should be right. It should start with proper data. So, what would be the top two activities to to get this right? Mm. Um, first of all, the way we train data scientists is that we only hand them good problems. Um, so that's where DJ Patel's quote was so important. When you get in the real world, data doesn't look the way it looks in a textbook. Uh, to, to, to double down on that point, too, uh, again, you all know that I work at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, the company Data Blueprint is partly owned by them as well. And yet my colleagues from literally around the corner in computer science will come into me and they'll say, Peter, do you have any data that looks like this? And I'll say, well, I'm not sure, but what are you trying to accomplish? And they'll say, because I've got a great algorithm. And you know right there that they're thinking about the problem incorrectly. Yes, we should be looking to improve existing things, but what we really have to do is find out what business problems organizations are actually facing and then develop our capabilities as organizations to do this. A big piece of our capabilities are going to be our facility with the tools. So the easier a tool is to use and the faster it can be brought to be, become efficient um, is, is something that's going to help you to reduce the gap between where the typical vendors are. Uh, I've seen, uh, for example, many organizations that think they need a master data management solution that costs $10 million or so from one of the big five vendors um, be able to actually solve that particular problem for a couple of hundred thousand dollars of, of uh, data development work. And uh, it's a truly, uh, it seems miraculous, and I wish I could get paid on the percentage I save, but uh, that's not the way the world works. The other thing that happens, though, and I, David, maybe you want to elaborate on this after I finish, but when you walk into an organization and every data scientist, literally 100% of them will stand up and tell you I spend 80% of my time cleaning the data, munching the data, uh, exactly the, the, the type of thing that, that David was talking about. Um, that means if I take them and I add to them some discipline around data management and perhaps a little bit of technology, even if I only reduce their unproductive time from 80% to 60%, I've doubled their productivity. So that gives you an idea of the kind of leverage that we're facing uh, on all of this. Uh, I don't know, David, maybe there's an example that you guys have, have run through that you may, you know, shouldn't tell us the company or whatever, but can tell us, you know, something along those lines of how that was instructive and helpful? Yeah, I have a company in mind. It wasn't data scientists who were doing this work, but it was a marketing intelligence firm who had 10 analysts, each of which had about two customers where uh, they would be getting all of this social media data, opening it up in Excel, and spending pretty much half of their week each trying to prepare this data in Excel in order to get it into reports that they could send back to their clients. And that was the value that they were producing was these reports. Um, so obviously, spending half of your work week in Excel doing all of this data preparation work is extremely frustrating. and. Uh, by bringing in Trifacta, they were able to create sort of a, a master recipe to automate all of this work. Um, it wasn't particularly challenging work, but because they didn't have the right technologies in place, they couldn't do it productively and they were spending so much manual time. Um, so once they were able to get it in place, there was a single person who was managing uh, the data flowing through Trifacta and every other analyst had all of that time freed up to work with additional clients, to find additional insights for their clients, to bring more value to their clients. Um, so, I mean, nobody goes into the field of data to do this preparation work. That's not the glory work. That's not the fun work. Um, so the more time that you can 
free up to do work outside of that, the better. David, I'll give you a part of that story to complement as well. So I worked with a group that had the very same type of problem and we brought in some similar types of technologies to help them. But what was interesting about this was that we were able to justify the total cost of the project out of the savings in the HR dollars because the analysts were so dissatisfied with the work that they were doing, they would only stay in the jobs about three months and then they would leave. So just to reduce the turnover, they figured it cost them $50,000 every time they hired a new analyst. And you can do the numbers there and come up with some, some pretty good things. So again, it's not an uncommon story what David is describing. And what's really sad to us as data professionals is that we can't get more people to understand this better. Um, we have to blame ourselves because we're not being as articulate as we could because it's a, a very clear cut case to most of us. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Back to you, Shannon. <laughs> I love your soapboxes. They're good. Um, so, you know, in order to govern the data, we need data-minded people. So, and so far, I've never seen established data roles, uh, data steward, data owner, chief data officer, et cetera. Do you know such standard description of these roles? Oh, my goodness, I get to plug a book. Uh, one called The uh, Case for the Chief Data Officer, available at Amazon.com by myself and uh, my colleague, Mike Gorman, who I mentioned earlier in this. Um, we also have a society called the Society of International, uh, excuse me, the International Society of Chief Data Officers um, that's working in conjunction with DEMA to help refine these. Um, but I'll, I'll add something interesting to the question on this. When I go into organizations, one of the things that tells me about the maturity of the organization is the existence of these categories. Um, Right now, the U.S. government only tracks two data categories, database administrator and data administrator. They don't track data scientists. They don't track anything else uh, that goes into these. And um, it's unfortunate because it doesn't give us a lot of good data about ourselves as a profession. So DEMA may, in fact, have to start doing this. But our, our, our goal is to put some meat on the bones of this, again, I said it before, immature discipline and try to get people to realize that, that this is something that we actually need to pay more attention to, to formalize these things, at least within our organization. So if I walk into a company and they've got categories as we're in the question there, uh, they're a pretty mature organization, whereas if all they've got is, uh, yeah, there's somebody that handles data, he's over there in the corner. Um, you know, that's, that's probably not an organization that's high on those maturity. That's a great question, very interesting. Anybody any comments on that? You look for no, job I categories. I yeah. think you covered it. Right. And if an organization has generated its critical data elements and uh, profiled them, what would you recommend as next steps other than mounting projects to remed uh, remediate discovered data quality issues? Looking at the data at rest is good. Uh, the next step up from an organization is to look at data at motion and to start to trace the workflows through. So one of the things I promote is something I call more of an active data governance. Um, data governance will increase quality of data as a result of people doing things and then putting new controls in place and eventually that data will come in. It's kind of like sitting at the bottom of Niagara Falls and expecting somebody upstream to change materially the quality of the water. Um, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you know that changing that water quality is going to take quite a bit of work. So I call most data governance efforts around that sort of passive data governance. It's not really passive, but it, it, it gives you the sense on the scale. I also like the data governance professional group to be responsible for going in and remediating uh, data quality problems, and data uh, architecture challenges. And while those are really good things to work around, you can even go a bit beyond that. I, if I can, I try to make sure that part of the data governance charter and the charter of the chief data officer is something that we used to call business process reengineering. Everybody in the organization, as you increased literacy through the organization should be responsible knowing where the data comes from and where it goes to. Uh, a very simple example on that, one hospital system I worked with had a default admission code and most of the people who did the admitting did not bother to admit with an admission code because they were paid to be optimized on speed. So they would bypass that and everybody in the organization knew that that data was not good except for the data, uh, except for the hospital administrator who then decided they were going to go off and do a bunch of knee surgery, which was the default hospital admission code. Uh, again, a well-designed practice would have uh, eliminated that process and prevented that mistake from being made. In this case, it wasn't a large mistake, but nevertheless, people do make good decisions on bad data. 
And so we've got to put those processes and practices in there, and we need some tools to go back and help us because we have to pay for the technical debt that we've incurred of so much neglect up to this point. And you need professionals to deal with past um, uh, neglect. And follow up to the question, what that um, would be the time to start looking for a tool to help manage these things moving forward. So I'll, I'll jump in here and say what I'm pretty sure David would want me to say anyway, which I believe in 100%. He just told you there's a free one out there. Go use it. Um, if you don't know things about these tools, almost all of them have some sort of equivalent or free version that you can download. And if you don't have time, I understand everybody's stressed and we're in a period of, of uh, uh, you know, pandemic at this point. Um, but at some point, we will get to some semblance of a new normal, whatever that happens to be. Go find your local college and university. If you don't have time for it, I guarantee you there's an undergraduate just dying to do something like that and say, hey, you get out there. Here's some stuff. Show me what you can do with these types of things. And you'd be amazed at the results that will come back. And then they can teach you instead of you having to learn it yourself. But now is, is the time. If you're, if you're doing this all without automation, um, I will estimate there's a lot of savings that we can find in your organization. David, any, anything to add on that? Do you guys have to do business cases around? No, I think you're right. There's so many ways to start experimenting with different tools out there. Everyone's got free trials or free perpetual products. Um, so uh, just a matter of doing it one step at a time, figuring out what the most important things to tackle first are um, and starting to fill in some of the gaps that you think you have. That's really good guidance. I've taken my class for this semester, my graduate class this semester, and I put them at a data set called usaspending.gov, which has seven, six, excuse me, five, six of the entire U.S. budget for the past 20 years out there. Um, and they, they will do something like, um, you know, oh, I'd really like to find out if the flavor of grants increased or decreased under various administrations. Well, that turns out to be a PhD dissertation. So David's advice to start small and build up is much, much better way to do it. I've seen groups spend years doing that and discovering that there was no, nothing they could actually learn from the data, even though the data existed and they were able to retrieve it and put it into a model. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to get results. So start small, build up from there. Absolutely the best type of advice. And David, this question is specifically for you. Does Trifecta cover the complete data management cycle process like data architecture, business process, metadata, data integration, et cetera? Uh, it doesn't cover the whole uh, data management process. What we're mostly focused on is uh, self-service data preparation, so allowing uh, business teams, data scientists, data analysts, even some data engineers to have sort of a collaborative platform where they can access their data from data warehouses or data lakes or databases, uh, profile and prepare that data, and then publish it back to a data warehouse or directly to a BI tool. Um, so generally speaking, it's after data has landed in their sort of centralized uh, enterprise data warehouse or data lake, um, but before the analytics process. So um, it's not, it's not a metadata management tool. Um, it's not a data movement tool. Um, it's more data refinement, data preparation. Does that, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I think that first slide that you showed up, I'm not the first slide, but that one slide that you showed up about the 80%, that 80% is really your market, right? Yep, that's exactly right, yep. So think about that, guys. It's free, go grab a copy, take a look. I think we've got time for a few more questions here. You know, if an organization has generated its inventory of critical data and profiled them, what would you recommend as next steps other than, um, oh, I just already asked that. I'm just going to repeat that question. Here we go. Sorry. I can give you the same answer if you want. <laughs> Find <laughs> okay. your workflow pieces and things I'm... that are important. Here we go. <laughs> I was just going down the line. <laughs> uh, if data management is so important, why is this why is this topic uh, neglected by almost all enterprises? Does it mean you can get along without sophisticated enterprise data architecture? Maybe because the functionality and operability is essential. 
I think too many do or uh, try to. Um, for 30 years, the academic community has been telling people that the only thing you need to know about data is how to build a new Oracle database. And that's because Oracle gives it away, which means that our managers, as well as people who are not data people, look at what we do and say, you're only needed when you're building new databases. That's why we're not invited to conversations. That's why we don't have um, um, you know, visibility into certain initiatives. I found out at one point there was one third of the ERP implementations that were going on in one specific year had no involvement from any data people. Can you imagine such a thing? So we have literally taught people incorrectly. And I, I just say that as a professor, I just I apologize to you because you guys have spent a lot of money to send your students off to be ta taught incorrectly. And that's a crime and something should be done about that. I hope I'm not locking people up, but we definitely need to change it. Uh, again, obviously, Shannon, you got me on a soapbox on that one. <laughs> David, anything you want to add there? Nope, I don't think so. I think Peter has it. <laughs> Sorry, let me take all the hits on that one. That's what that's what you. No, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> so actually, let's let's ask the three of us though. So I I had a course in database in my undergraduate. When I went to my master's program, they gave me the same database course over the second time. Um, which was sort of redundant. Um, and my PhD level, they gave me an exam, and I happened to have read the chapter from which the exam came out. So I looked like a database expert uh, on that, and I, I, I was not uh, at that point. Again, I'd had those two pieces. I didn't really start studying data until I got into the Defense Department, um, late 80s, uh, uh, around this, and started working with DEMA. So I did not have the benefit of that, and, and I know what we've been teaching people since then. David, did you have a course in data and what we were doing? What did they tell you about? Uh, so I studied math in undergrad, and all of the statistics courses that I had uh, had very clean data sets. So obviously not super real world scenarios that we were presented. Instead, it was, here's this, you know, perfect clean data set. Let's do some analysis or regression on this data set without any of the uh, upfront work that often needs to be done in in real world scenarios. So that was that was generally my experience. And I've never asked Shannon. Shannon, what courses did you have in data that got you here? Oh my goodness, you're putting me on the spot. School of Hard Knocks is a perfectly good answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> in your expertise, having having put together all these programs all these years. Yeah, well, you know, that's just it. You know, I, I've produced about 500 webinars, so um, <laughs> it's been a it's been a crash course of, of princess, much less the content on the website. <laughs> yeah, so, so even data journalism as a as a career field, we we, we teach them how to process the data once they get nicely cured data sets. And that's a really important skill. But at the same time, there's, there's a lot of other aspects of this. And I'm just, I'm so frustrated that we, we haven't solved that problem. Let me just go back to one slide that we had early on. There we go. I will say I was an analyst in my past life. Mm -hmm. And not just uh, uh, analysts, you actually uh, uh, manage business flows too, so. Yes. So, so, you know, if this is data, right, data science is a piece of this, but so mm -hmm. is all the rest of these things. And if we don't even tell people, I mean, if you talk to data scientists, they don't think any of the rest of this stuff exists because they've never been told about it. And, and the same thing happens in way too many places. So um, we need to, to, to make more specialists around data, and we need to put uh, data-specific qualifications in our knowledge worker job descriptions. Uh, and I think that will make a, a difference. We'll certainly start to drive the market. Um, indeed. My, my sister is a surgeon. She just started getting into research. And she, uh, in her big first massive big project, she started working with a data scientist. And finally, the light bulb went on. Oh, I understand what you do now. I understand who you work with. <laughs> That's very good. Well, that is right. Uh, we are wrapping up right at the end of the hour here. Peter, I do want to say thank you so much, and thanks to Trifecta for sponsoring. David, thank you so much for joining us. Again, just a reminder to everybody, uh, I will be sending out a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout here. We've got a couple uh, pieces. We'll get some information on the Trifecta um, download for you as well, or the free trial. 
Uh, again, Peter, thank you so much. David, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our attendees. Hope you all have a great day and stay safe out there. We'll all get bored sooner or later. Take care. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks, Dave.